Last week, the UK government published its net zero strategy. Green is good! It's groundbreaking in that no other country has yet produced such a detailed roadmap of how to get to net zero carbon whilst being a major economy. And it has some good things that other countries should learn from. But it has some major undermining flaws. And it's just the firing gun for a pretty big fight. Let's have a look. The UK Net Zero Strategy. The centrepiece was a 368-page document, and it was accompanied by 20 others, ranging from a 200-page heat and building strategy all the way down to a research document on how to nudge the public into behaviour changes, which was rapidly pulled from publication and described as published in error and not reflecting government policy. The latest report on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that net zero emissions is a precondition for ending the growth of human impact on the climate. Most of the world's nations have accepted that, and with varying degrees of urgency that tend to vary in line with how much their existing status quo relies on fossil fuels, the nations of the world are trying to grapple with what that means. The UK has said that it's aiming to achieve a 68% reduction in emissions by 2030, and it says this strategy is in line with what's needed to achieve that. It's a detailed plan, which can be criticised, which is kind of the point. The world's been swapping fond wishes and generalities for the last couple of decades. Now there's a plan. Its strengths and its flaws can inform others, and on the eve of COP26, it provides a possible model for others to adapt and to consider, and of course to criticise. Those who swear that it could all be done a lot quicker, and it's all really rather easy so long as you have a political will, they have not provided such detail, and I would suggest for good reason. The UK strategy adopts four key principles. Consumer choice. No one will be required to rip out their boiler or scrap their current car. Polluter pays. The biggest polluters will pay the most through fair carbon pricing. Protecting the vulnerable. Government support in the form of energy bill discounts, energy efficiency upgrades and more. And innovation. We will work with businesses to continue delivering deep cost reductions in low carbon technology. These principles are really about reassuring people in the short term, I would suggest. Some have painted authoritarian and very costly visions of what a net zero society must be. And the Conservative government's position here is that that's not how they at least are going to choose to do these things. In the medium term, of course, consumer choice doesn't mean that when you buy a new boiler in the 2030s to replace your aged boiler that has then reached the end of its life, you will have the choice to still buy another gas boiler. It just means you won't be required to remove your existing stuff before you would have had to do so anyway. Hopefully by the time you do, the economics of the alternatives will mean that the greener version will be roughly the same cost as what you would have been expected to pay in a like-for-like -like replacement, and hopefully it will also work as well. Critics will say that seems a long way off, with the alternatives currently much more costly. Advocates will point out that they were saying the same about wind and solar power just about a decade ago. The report makes the case for optimism, saying this, We have consistently underestimated how quickly the cost of clean technology would fall to date. A statement that's substantiated with this graph, showing the difference between projections and reality. Which is true. It's a good argument against pessimism and cynicism. It's not in itself a guarantee of success. You know, predicting the future is hard doesn't always mean that you get it wrong on the right side, if you see what I mean. But where the issues around consumer choice really come in, of course, are the area of behaviour change. Whenever the BBC or the Guardian newspaper talks about climate change policy, it rarely takes more than five minutes before they switch focus to their favourite talking points, getting people to reduce eating meat and less flying. But the net zero strategy determinedly does not go there saying instead that it aims to go with the grain of existing behaviours and trends, and adding that it has no intention of telling the British public to forego their foreign holidays. 
And the truth is that regardless of the obsession of the campaigners with such issues, the big areas really lie in those areas that they find much less interesting to talk about. This graph shows the contribution each of the sectors are expected to make to the overall decline in emissions. Now, it won't look exactly like that in reality. Some innovations may turn out to be bigger game changers than people dared to predict. And, you know, others may turn out to be less promising than originally hoped or even complete dead ends. A lot of money for investment will be needed for all this progress. The government aims to pay for the things that it must core infrastructure, jump-starting new technologies, but as much as possible to leverage private sector investment, up to £9 billion by 2030. The challenge of all this centres around cost, of course. Inconveniently, we're having this discussion after the response to the pandemic has devastated the public finances and the country has taken on huge amounts of additional debt. In its separate document, the Treasury argued that net zero costs should not be met with additional borrowing, passing those costs on to future taxpayers. One former Treasury official, Nick Maybe, disagreed with this, saying that it was simply an error to say that the government shouldn't borrow at what he described as historically low interest rates to finance a transition that will, after all, pay dividends in the future. Which is fine, so long as interest rates stay at that historic low even though we just printed large amounts of money and even though we can see massive inflationary pressure all around us. I have to say, I can see why a Conservative Chancellor might be a little bit cautious about that argument. The Treasury's aim is that household electricity, heating and vehicle costs will be broadly in line in 2050 with what they are today. It's the intention that the new technology will be mainstreamed and available for the same cost to consumers. Electricity for heating, not natural gas, maybe. Electric vehicles taxed via road pricing rather than fuel duty, maybe. But in line with the level of spending of the status quo. How we get to that point is the challenge, of course. It aims to get competitive markets doing the heavy lifting via carbon pricing while recognising that on its own it won't get the job done. So what is the strategy across all of the different sectors? Well, let's take a canter through some of the headlines, starting with the electric power grid. This is the area that has seen the most change to date, with emissions falling 72% since 1990. In principle, the strategy is for the electricity grid to be wholly decarbonised by 2035. And remember, this is at the same time as it has to be expanded significantly because you're moving a lot of ground level transport, for instance, on to be powered by it, electric vehicles. Plus, starting by then to get significant amounts of building heating powered by it. The strategy estimates that such expansion will involve a 40 to 60 percent increase in capacity. So, energy sources. It's no surprise that the government continues to be committed to the expansion of wind power. We knew that. But with a view to recent events, perhaps, it also talks a lot more than it had been recently about the need for system reliability. That means the expansion of power generation with carbon capture and storage. It also means that the strategy includes £120 million for future nuclear power, including new generation small modular reactors, the first of which it wants to be in place by 2030. It signalled additionally that it intended to add at least one large-scale project, which will probably end up being Sizewell C, but that remains still to be confirmed. Twitter, by the way, was confused by the signal on nuclear power. Half were describing the strategy as having nuclear at its heart. The other half that it was completely peripheral. The fact that people might see what they want to see isn't a surprise, I suppose, but it is testament to the fact there is still something of a lack of clarity on the details. Now, I said before that the grid would increase in capacity partly because of transport. So let's have a look at that sector. Transport is the single largest contributor to the UK's greenhouse gas emissions. Largely, it is pushing the market for electric vehicles by announcing, some time ago, it's not new to this strategy, that petrol fuelled cars would be banned from sale by 2030. What is new is that this strategy announces a zero emission vehicle mandate for car manufacturers. It requires them to scale up the number of electric vehicles they sell from 2024 onwards, 
just so that there's no question of simply continuing with a status quo until it falls off a legislative cliff in 2030. The government will invest to help the production of a countrywide network of electric vehicle charging points alongside other investment for alternatives such as buses, walking and cycling. In early stages, there would be grants for electric vehicle buyers while the push to scale takes time to start bringing the prices down, hopefully to reach being in line with existing petrol-driven vehicles. Unsurprisingly, that would result in major emissions reductions by 2035 if it were to be delivered. Heavy goods vehicles may end up being focused on hydrogen power or electric. Trials have been ongoing to evaluate the best fit options there. Aviation is the area where it's hardest to make reductions. Unsurprisingly, because the basic physics of flying makes decarbonising, certainly on the basis of existing technology, pretty much impossible. It will no doubt be a problem we will solve, probably not by 2050, at least certainly not at scale. Incentivising the development of lower emission fuels while encouraging longer term innovation has been the government's focus to date. It seems it is not attracted to the idea of harassing people not to fly, at least not yet. Then you have heavy industry, particularly industries such as steel making and cement, areas that are utterly crucial for how we construct our infrastructure, but which are hugely energy intensive. That makes them big emitters and often quite well optimised already for existing technology. Because, you know, if your process uses a lot of energy, then you find all the ways you can to reduce that consumption because it's going to make a big difference to the bottom line. So mostly in this area, it is going to be about fuel switching, particularly to the use of green hydrogen and carbon capture technologies. With the right measures, the government believes there could be a drop in emissions of 62 to 76% by 2035, but both technologies need to massively expand from where they are today. The new strategy more than doubles the previous carbon capture target at 10 million tonnes by 2030. The hydrogen component sees it providing from 10 to 20 terawatt hours by 2030, pushing on up to 50 terawatt hours just five years later. With that in mind, £140 million is committed to set up a decarbonisation and hydrogen scheme, with an initial aim of awarding private sector contracts to produce up to 250 megawatts of hydrogen in 2023. So that's heavy industry, an absolutely crucial area, but let's face it, not one that the general public cares that much about. The one that they do care, one of the trickiest areas for government to tackle, is that of home heating. Heating buildings contribute nearly a quarter of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions. Most of that comes from natural gas, with some particularly for rural areas that are not on the gas grid, from heating oil. Improvements in the efficiency of boilers has helped to reduce those emissions by 14% since 1990, but that won't take us a whole lot further. And it's not helped by the fact that the UK's housing stock has long been famous for having extremely poor energy efficiency. New houses are generally meeting higher standards. Old houses are really not. Out of the 29 million existing homes in the country, something like 19 million are estimated by the government to be rated at the lowest score for energy efficiency. Now that needs to be tackled whatever energy source you use. And when it comes to that heat source of choice, the government is clear that electric heat pumps is going to be the biggest part of the answer. When he previously launched a 10-point plan, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson suggested that 600,000 new heat pumps would be installed per year by 2028. For context, the amount sold in 2021 is just 67,000. Now, of course, you can't sell 60,000 in one year and then leap straight to 600,000 the next. For one thing, there simply aren't the people trained to install them, even if the units were ready to be shipped in that sort of quantity, which of course they're not. For another, the price of electric heat pumps is currently way too high to see the market naturally expand to those sorts of quantities. Something like 10 to 12,000 pounds for a new heat pump compared to around 1,500 pounds for a standard boiler. The government intends to provide £5,000 grants to switch to an air-sourced heat pump or £6,000 to a ground-sourced one. That would pay for 90,000 heat pumps over three years, which is obviously just a drop in the bucket compared to those target numbers. The government's belief is that by giving the market an early shove 
it will start the process in motion that will see the prices start to come down and then it will take off knowing that new gas boilers are going to be banned in due course in any case as prices become affordable. Some have been extremely sceptical about how much that's achievable based on the restrained government input. Analysis by Octopus Energy's Centre for Net Zero argues that with that level of financial support, demand could reach 380,000 heat pumps by year three, which is more of the sort of quantity that is in line with the government's ultimate targets and also more likely to actually start to achieve that cost reduction goal as you get into those numbers. That said, it's not unreasonable for the government to seek to achieve the market goal with the minimum public expenditure rather than simply going with the expectations of a lot of the left-leaning activists that government spending on every single thing is obviously the way forward. If it turns out to be too little, after all, you can always turn up for support. But on the other hand, once you've established a level, it's usually harder to bring it down. I'm not entirely sure what the value proposition of a heat pump is right now, though. I mean, there will be some eco-conscious early adopters, people who are wealthy enough that a half-price heat pump will seem an attractive option. For the rest of us, you look at that and say, well, if we're all expecting that that price is going to come down substantially, let's just wait a while while that happens. Because half of 10 grand is still way more money than we want to spend and we should expect the technology to improve as well as it gets pushed to scale. Will the operating costs incentivize people to switch? Not at the moment, because there's a carbon price on electricity, but not on natural gas. Now that is going to change with the likelihood of swapping the levy onto fossil fuels that the government wants to discourage and away from electricity. There's more of a push down the line though. From 2024, there will be a new scheme, one that is expected to mandate that manufacturers have to ensure that a stated percentage of their sales are from heat pumps, a percentage that will then gradually grow over time. In so doing, it expects to incentivize manufacturers to ensure that they bring rapid innovation to heat pump products to make them cost competitive and to make them attractive in terms of their performance. Since customers will retain the ability to choose, the companies will be using that innovation and their marketing to encourage growing numbers of consumers to voluntarily make the switch and to ensure that those who do so then have a positive experience. Which kind of makes sense. The anti-net zero campaigners make hay at the moment from describing heat pumps as poor substitutes, much more expensive for a less good quality product. Rather like low energy light bulbs used to be, in fact. Those people complained then and said that the old standard high energy consumption bulbs should be kept. But of course, what actually happened was that it pushed the companies to innovate and come back with superior LED light products, at which point the complaints went away. The government hopes the same can happen here. Although with such a major purchase around which a key component of modern comfortable life revolves, it is a much bigger deal. The other challenge around all of that is to do with energy efficiency, because heat pumps will only really perform well if there are very high standards of insulation and energy efficiency in the homes where it's installed. There is no new money in the strategy for energy efficiency, which seems to be relying on regulation to drive it. And that may well become an aggravating issue when it's trying to push heat pump deployment to scale. On the question of hydrogen for home heating, the government's position continues to be that it's waiting on the result of ongoing trials. I think they're wasting their time and they should just count it out from a, as early a stage as they can. Hydrogen is at standstill in the UK and a lot of the energy is lost in the conversion process from electricity to hydrogen. It's needed to be ramped up significantly just to be used by high energy users such as steel and cement as we discussed and maybe for HGVs. That's already incredibly ambitious. The idea that it could become a major component of home heating seems just incredible. I understand the temptation. I mean, you have a massive gas grid across the country you'd love to be able to repurpose for the benefit of hydrogen. Ain't gonna happen. The trials will just confirm that it's not feasible. They will finally throw in the towel, having wasted a bunch of time and money. 
That's my prediction anyway. Then we get to agriculture as well as other land use issues. This one's tricky because there are some factors here that are genuinely difficult to address and the farming sector as a whole contributes 10% to UK emissions. We've seen how confused ideas and ideology can take root here, pun not intended. See the EU's farm to fork policy which in targeting 25% of all agriculture to be organic would actually make emissions worse by reducing yields and leading to a higher percentage of imports. Now, the strategy includes existing commitments to ramp up tree planting, looking to triple current rates of planting by the end of his parliament. But when it comes to farming, it's remarkably vague. The detail of the changes it expects to see are still to be confirmed. It simply suggests that 75% of farmers in England will be involved with low carbon practices by 2030, which is kind of a meaningless commitment. So those are some of the different sectors. Where does all this leave us? The UK strategy is a step up in ambition compared to what came before. In spite of what some might have expected, it is a substantial and serious document that puts the UK in the position of having the most comprehensive such plan of anyone in the world so far. The biggest differences are on the amount of commitment it's now showing behind carbon capture, electric vehicles, building heating, on nuclear power and on hydrogen as well. Although it throws in some new money, it takes the approach of using prices and regulation to drive market responses. And it does not take the Committee on Climate Change's invitation to start nudging consumers into changing their behaviours. Now, that won't stop the BBC and The Guardian talking about it incessantly, I dare say. We have a lot more of that to come. But it's really acknowledged that the biggest area of difficulty, the contentious area, that is going to be costly and challenging to get right, is the heating of buildings. It also expects carbon pricing to do a lot of the heavy lifting, with a big emphasis, now that the UK has left the EU, for the UK's own emissions trading scheme, ETS. And it says this, the UK ETS will be aligned to our net zero target, giving industry the certainty they need to invest in low carbon technologies. The UK ETS is a crucial way in which we ensure that our pathway is rooted in cost-effective market-led solutions. And it says the intention is to expand the scheme to cover all emissions, two-thirds of which are currently not covered. Which is going to be a point of some contention in the short term, as energy prices are soaring at the moment and inflation for a whole range of goods and services seems to be about to do likewise. And that's one of the big questions. Will the relatively modest amount of money aimed at protecting the vulnerable from some of the costs of this, will that be enough to fend off an inevitable backlash? It's an open question. If the fighting gets particularly fierce, will the innovators feel that they have still enough certainty in near-term commitments that they will be able to mobilise the investment that the government is hoping for? Because making this work in practice... It's not going to be easy. What the government's outlined is a completely different energy system to the one that we've had for the last few decades. And the transition has to keep energy security and affordability all the way through. It's not obvious that the strategy is wholly convincing, that the government has a good enough grasp of the details to be able to make it clear that it can achieve that. Not yet. And it's worth noting as well that the government's plan is mostly, with some key differences, mostly in line with the UK Committee on Climate Change proposals. That may be its strength, but also potentially its weakness. Critics of Net Zero have found ammunition to attack the CCC's work, having forced via the courts disclosure on some of the figures that it used to support its proposals. The most recently highlighted just this week, for instance, is that the modelling used to justify the wind power programme assumed a small number of days of calm weather when wind turbines would underperform in energy contribution to the grid. The Committee on Climate Change projected that in 2050, when the UK would reach net zero, there would be just seven days on which wind turbines would produce less than 10% of their potential output. So far this year nearly the end of October, there have been 65 such days. Now, we know this year has had some exceptionally calm weather, but the figures for previous years still make the point. 30 days in 2020, 33 in 2019 and 56 in 2018. 
Now, those figures come from Net Zero Watch, a campaign group. I haven't separately checked them. The Committee on Climate Change told The Telegraph they stand behind their figures and it's hard to tease out the nuance of this sort of dispute in the immediate post-publication situation. But even if those figures turn out to be exaggerated from the campaign group, it's true to say that the current scientific literature predicts that wind speeds, which have been declining over recent decades before a recent uptick in the last few years, will decline further in the future with global warming, a phenomenon described as global stilling. That being the case, it raises the question why you wouldn't acknowledge that. I mean, the anti-net zero people use the disparity simply to declare that net zero is not a feasible target, which is not a persuasive argument if you accept the need for the goal, because that's just an obstacle, we can get around it. But it does mean you should reconsider, for instance, how big a percentage of your power is going to come from nuclear. Yeah, or something. Something that doesn't just involve crossing your fingers and hoping for wind. By the way, some people hold wind power to be controversial for other reasons, while others see it as the key component for the net zero future. I made a video here that went deep into the arguments for and against. If you've gotten this far, you might be interested to give that one a look next.